We off in this place, catching vibes, sit back and we place in the sky like a mother's space. Natural high, light it up, light it up, light it up, light it up. Light it up. What's going on, Cigar World? What's going on, Cigar Thurs? This is Jack, the Cigar Thurs, and I'm back with another banger. Before we get started, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, give us a huge thumbs up. And if you're watching on Facebook, don't be the only one that had this lovely content at your face. Make sure you go ahead and hit that share button, hit that like button, create a watch party, Invite people. I don't care what you do, but let's bring in an audience for our, our guest of honor today. A couple things before we really get started and dive into this segment that I'm I'm really itching to get into because I think it's going to be a freaking phenomenal segment. Uh, let's talk about some details surrounding Dapper D Cigars. Dapper D Cigars will, uh, is shooting to open at the end of the month. We are on track. If you didn't watch our new content changes uh, that we have coming up, Within um, 2021 with the YouTube channel, we're changing some things up. We're getting out of really the educational phase and really getting into the let's dive more deeper into me. I feel like I give you all a good glimpse of that on the virtual smoke deck, but we want to you know make sure it's a little bit more personal for you guys. Um, if you're new to the channel and you're new to watching, man, make sure you go ahead and hit that hit that uh comment bar. Uh, comment some things, comment some questions, comment some concerns, comment whatever you want, and they would display up on the uh, the screen right before you guys. Shout out to all the people that's watching right now, man. Honestly, these shows wouldn't be anything without you. Our guests of honor wouldn't really feel welcome if it wasn't for you. So thank you so much. Um, I don't want to mess that up, but Castelli Castellino, Castellino Zamora. Thanks for tuning in. Johnny Smokes. Johnny Smokes in the J train. It's in the house. Man, shout out to my man, Lee Weiser. Uh, David, man, thanks so much for tuning in. Lee, man, Lee said, uh, what's up, John? Glenn, thank you so much for joining, man. That's my guy. And my boy, Great Cliff. Great Wolf, I mean, you know what it is. If you go to the Johnny Smokes whereby, then you know his name. If not, you need to tune in at 8 o'clock or whenever we get done with this segment, man. And uh, D-Hub on the deck, Arizona in the house, man, all the way from Arizona, man. Thank you so much for tuning in. With that being said, man, I don't want to take up too much of the time with our, our guest of honor. We're just me talking, man. Um, I got, before we go, I got this little fancy little system going on now. I hope you guys don't feel like I'm yelling. If I am, hit the comment bar and be like, turn it down, Jack. With, with that being said, man, um, our guest of honor is coming all the way from New Jersey, Millville, New Jersey, where she owns the Royal Leaf. She is a sister of the Leaf and also a veteran-owned business. And there was like no reason why I was like, we got to do this. Me and myself being a veteran and this being a virtual smoke deck, man, we're going to dive into that a lot. But without further ado, let's introduce our guest of the hour, D. Bitman. What's going on, D? Hey, hey. Hey. Man, hey. I'm excited. I'm excited to be on here. I really Man, am. We are excited really to up. have you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are excited to have you and really dive into, you know, everything that's surrounding D as well as the Royal Leaf and also just, you know, building the gaps between the brick and mortars. You know, too many times we feel like we're, we're against one another versus just understanding we are brothers and sisters of the Leaf that are here to simply uplift the other brick and mortar. We all do successful when everybody around us uh, does success. Uh, does successful, excuse me. Uh, so, so D, without further ado, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day, your busy schedule, running your business to sit down with us on a virtual smoke deck. We're really interested in to learning more about you and learning more about Royal Leaf and everything that it, it goes into play. With that being said, man, go ahead and tell some uh, tell the folks uh, a little bit about you, a little bit of your history and uh, your story. All right. So, well, I, I'm going to backtrack to something you just said, because I'm going to I'm going to call somebody out right away that I know is on with uh, John Reamer. 
Um, can you hear me okay? I'm hearing, yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody saying, turn it up. Okay. Oh, no. That, Kevin, that was... Kevin Kythan uh -huh. uses a word that I love coopetition. Coopetition. All right. I'm stealing it from him. But, <laughs> you know, when you said about, about shops, you know, all of us brothers and sisters and just getting along and, you know, uh, let's play well together. So, you know, we'll save that for later, but I just wanted to put that out there. Most definitely. So, so hey, my name is actually Diana. Um, a lot of people didn't know that. No, I, I, go by, I, go by like, D. I go by I, D. I go by D because know that was her name. <laughs> yeah, no, well, because here, here's the deal, man. You know, we all have our little pet peeves. And one of mine, I don't know what it is. You can have my name spelled there. You can do whatever. And inevitably, people will call me Diane. And I tell them, look, let me just give you a little shove, <laughs> Diane. Uh, you know, and so, and so when I when I was going to the shop, it just it just oh man, it just like I thought, man, I'm here to relax. I can't be like doing this all the time. Hey, Diane, you know. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to a nickname that people gave me when I was growing up, and it was so much easier. Just call me D. So much yeah. easier, you know. So. That that's the deal. Now you know that. Now you know if you if you see Diana, that's me. So, <laughs> so anyhow, so I mean, it kind of goes the same for me. Like your story is a lot cooler than mine, honestly. My my name, my first name is Darian, mm -hmm. and I go by Jack. And a lot of people that don't really know me, they'd be like, "Hey, Darian," uh, or they call the shop, be like, "Hey, I'm looking to speak with Darian," and I had already introduced myself as Jack. And I was like, yeah, I'm looking to enter, I'm looking to speak with Darian. I was like, well, this is him. Well, you said Jack. Well, that's what I go by. I, I personally do not like my first name. You know, being hey, in the man, military. You, know, you, can pick, you can pick your, you know, pick your uh, friends, pick your name, but you can't pick your family, you know. So you might as well, you might as well get what you want. I kept it close because it was like, <laughs> I just tell people, if you can say the alphabet, you got my name, A, B, C, D. You well, got I, it. I look at it like this, right? In the military. We call by our, our last name. For Absolutely. So long. I was in the Navy for 10 years. So, you know, Jack Jackson, all that was was what they called me. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it just stuck. Yeah. Uh, it's the same way. I still like, you know, at my day job, we all call each other by our last names. So it's, you know, it's just it's just the way, the way it is. So. So let's see here. So anyway, um I didn't smoke. Well, I've been smoking cigars probably. God, I got to do the math now. Over 20 years. Okay. Over 20 years. Um, and I'm 62. So it tells you I started later. You 62? I'm 62, brother. Jesus. Yes. I'm, I'm 62. Like I'm 62. Yeah. Well, you know, may not look at body feels it, but uh, <laughs> so. I went into the military, actually. I went and got my nursing degree because I always wanted to go to college. You know, life got in the way, did my thing, got into college, got my nursing degree. And the Army needed ER trauma nurses. I was in great shape at 43, and I went in. Uh -huh. So that was like just pre-9-11. And I had always, my grandfather was a pipe smoker. And I remember like growing up, I would watch him. I was mesmerized by this man. He would sit there and pack this pipe and, you know, and then when he would smoke, it was just so, it was, it was like a spiritual, you know, watching, you know? So I never forgot that. And I always played around. I always messed with pipes throughout my, throughout my adult life, but I had never picked up a cigar, nothing. And so I get in the military and, you know, a rough time. I was in from 2001 to 2010. So you, you know the deal and a yeah. uh, lot going on, taking care of mass casualties, doing whatever. And so, you know, I always say to people, when you get done at the end of a long shift or long mass cow or whatever, you ain't going to sit sit there and go, so how'd that make you feel today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, there's no time for that crap, man. So make it. Right. So one of, one of the sergeants would come out and hand out cigars. That's how I started smoking cigars. OK, that was that was absolutely how I started smoking cigars. Wow. Yeah. And so I smoked them all through my military career. And when I was uh, discharged in 2010, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing to feel sorry about. 
I'm cool. I got all my limbs. I'm in, I'm in good shape, you know? Right. So I, I always tell people I'm in good shape for the shape I'm in. Right. So I uh, got out of the military and I, I kept smoking cigars because I discovered they helped. You know, they kept me calm. They kept me, you know. So I isolated a lot. I didn't go out much. I didn't deal with people much. So, but I would smoke cigars at home. Yeah. Somebody convinced me to go to this uh, local cigar shop in my area. Royal Leaf wasn't around at the time. And uh, I went to an event against my better judgment because I didn't like to be around people. Okay. <laughs> and I go and it dawns on me when I'm talking to all these people that the larger majority of people were either law enforcement or military. Hmm. And so there was this comfort zone there. You know what I mean? So I went, I started going and, you know, in the meantime, I got my, I got my dog, I got my service dog. He's actually sitting in a chair right near me. And so life started getting better. Yeah. And the cigars went from way to decompress, way to cope, hobby, passion, and now a shop that I never saw coming. Right. <laughs> so, I'm telling you, that's how it works, don't it? Yo, it's like a rat. It's like a rabbit hole that just doesn't stop. You know <laughs> what I mean? Keep <laughs> going down it. I'm still free falling. You know what I mean? And then just like, you know, I hope, I hope I never hit. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's how. That's how this all. That's how this all went down. And uh, you know, here we go. Here we go. Little did I know. Yes, yeah. was going to happen. It starts the journey, right? Mm -hmm. It starts the journey. Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, thank you for your service. Um, you You're know, cool. I know a lot of people are tuning in. I know a couple of people I serve with personally in the Navy is tuning in. And, um, you know, to, to speak on the post-traumatic stress part about it, um, you know, I was diagnosed with anxiety. And uh, one thing that I realized is, you know, cigars really helped with that. When you start to see the different things that you've seen, and I didn't see what you've seen, so I'm not even going to try to portray like, man, I've I seen the trauma and all that limbs flowing off. We, and things, and things we, all, we all had our thing, man. Yes. Nobody, nobody's worse or better than the other. Absolutely. And, you know, during that time, you know, um, I just feel like, you know, so many people set aside what they think is the military way, right? They see these people and they, oh, you're guaranteed the checks and, you know, all of this stuff and all of that. You know, one thing that I always say is, yes, we get raised. Yes, the military gets raises, you know, once a year. But I think sometimes it needs to be a little bit bigger for what they put on. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, well, you know, the veterans, they get out and they have these VA benefits and different things that they, they, they get. And you don't understand, like, we almost had to die to get those things. We you got to fight for those VA benefits because actually, interestingly enough, what I do in my day job now, I do case management and I'm accredited as a veteran service officer. You'll know exactly what yeah, that means. Yeah, so. Okay. So I know what it takes. Yes. It's not an automatic. You don't get no. out and automatically get benefits from the VA. People don't realize that. There's no, there's no set thing. And you got to fight sometimes years yes. to get what I, I call the VA, the, the military's workman comp. You would <laughs> never have to fight as long as you do and as hard as you do for workman's comp in the civilian sector as you have to with the VA coming out of the military. Yes, I'm telling you, it's just it's like it's like an uphill battle that never. What's up, John? It hey, never yeah. tends to, to go. You know, any way you thought, you know, I got out with 90%, I mean, 80%. And mm -hmm. I, I had built my package up and I knew for sure I was going to get 100 this time. You know, they the, the rule of thumb is they give you 80 when you get out. The nine time I tell you, you deserve 100. You just got, they want you to go get it. Yeah. So I said, I said, okay, we're going to do that. We can play a stupid little game if you want to. 90% is what they, 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 they gave me. Yeah. The thing, the biggest thing that the, that I had, they they totally disregarded it. They say, yeah, that that is not um, that I guess whatever the case, that's not seeming important. So I said, you know what, higher review, higher review. I'm not even gonna play with y'all. Y'all gotta talk to me to get, get tell me on the phone that I'm not worth this, and, yep. and and that's. But it should not, like you said, it's like the it's like the military's workman workman comp, like. You you cannot 
but it's like for some pair reason, you know, people literally do not do that fight because they already know what to expect out of it. Well, and, you know, I mean, I've had I've had vets I've had vets die in the middle of trying to, especially the Vietnam crew. You know, like my heart breaks for them. You know, and and not you, we all have our things. You know, we all have our things. Gulf War, you know, they have the Gulf War syndrome. You know, um, Iraq, Afghanistan. You know, TBIs and burn pits and stuff like that. So you know, we all have our things. But Vietnam, I mean, come on, we can all agree that those guys and gals got screwed royally. Mm -hmm. You know, so. I mean, I'm still doing stuff for them, but sadly, some of them die before they get it. Or I had one guy actually about four months ago, man. It, oh, God, broke my heart. He just got 100% permanent in total, and then he died. Okay, so, you know, it's like years of fighting. Yeah. Years of fighting, or you have the guy that I get him to 100%. It's hanging in. You're trying to do everything, and he commits suicide. Mm. So, I mean, I've had, you know, so, you know, not to be, you know, Debbie Downer, you know, that's not what D stands for. But, um, you know, just just to put that little bit of spin of the of the reality that really is going on, you know, like, I don't know how you feel, but, you know, I appreciate when people say thank you for your service, you know, which, by the way, thank you. But sometimes it's just so empty. It's just so. It's, I, I don't even know how, you know, I don't even know how to respond sometimes because it's like the average person has no idea what a veteran goes through after they get out and trying to try to get their, uh, their stuff like, you know, taken care of. I mean, and even myself, I had to turn my own case over to a lawyer finally yeah. because of the same, the same thing, like, you know, and, and it's just been mistake after mistake after mistake on their part. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm pretty objective. I mean, the, the VA healthcare, I think is tremendous. I have yeah. no complaints about that, but the benefits administration, <laughs> I smoke a lot of cigars thinking about it. <laughs> hey, it, it, it's true. Like, it's like you, you, you do this fight and it's like, you know, the backstory, just like you said, you know, I just realized that the, the proper, I didn't realize, I just learned that the proper response to thank you for your, your services, thank you for your support. I never knew that. I used to be like, mm -hmm. well, you know, thank you. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. because, but like you said, it, it's just so empty. You know, at the end of the day, you have no clue. Like some people, you know, go to the military to change their life. And in, in reality, hard looking at it hard wise, you change your life. Probably not in the best way you you thought you was gonna change your life. Yeah, you, you have a lot of trauma, a lot of things yeah. you've seen, you know, in doing that. So yeah. But on the flip side to that, on the flip side to that, Jack, I got I got to say this: you and I would not be sitting here talking if I had not made that decision and put that uniform on and did what I did. That's why I said I have no, yeah. I don't have one single regret. Yeah, absolutely. Other than I wish I could have stayed. You know, being being older and being in, my body deteriorated faster. You know what I mean? I got nine and a half years in, but it tore it tore my joints up. You know what I mean? When you go in, when you go at the, in at that age and you're doing what twenty somethings are doing, it it tears you up. But you know, I would have stayed in. I still have days I miss it, man. I, yeah. I just would prefer to be back there and just doing my thing. And you know, um, so I don't have any regrets at all, regardless of what happens. I just get really impassioned about other people, you know, and fighting that fight to try to help them. And, you know, there's so many military and veteran people in the cigar business and industry and whatever. And, you know, man, you know, you, 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 you gotta care. That's just Absolutely. the way I see it. You gotta care. You know, I look at it. I look at it from one perspective. I'm thankful for it, but I don't miss it. I don't miss mm -hmm. the long deployments. I don't miss mm -hmm. time away from my family. Yeah, it taught me some great lessons. I met some great people. Um, but like you said, you know, if it wasn't for those experiences going through the military, you know, me going to, you know, those those different cities and states and and realizing what my passion was, I, we would never be here talking. You would have never picked up a cigar if you never would have went into no. the, into the no. military. I mean, same mm -hmm. same for me. I I seen I seen my my father figures doing it a lot growing up. I would have never picked up a cigar. And no. you know, and I think I think for for most, for most, I think we all 
thankful for our service and we we all appreciate what the service did for us. Um, Absolutely. But I think, you know, for me, getting out at 10 years was like, people were like, what in the hell are you thinking? And I'm like, I can't do this no more. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I get it. I mean, I always tell people it's a love-hate relationship. Yeah. It there are aspects is. about the military that no one, unless you've been there, can understand it. The camaraderie, the brotherhood and the sisterhood. Why do you think we're attracted to to the cigar community because of that same brotherhood and sisterhood? Yes. It, it's all it's all about relationship. Yes. You know what I mean? And and you know, I was talking to a a group of uh, middle school uh, students one day because I do you know I get called to go do some public speaking and stuff. And so I I said to the group, I said I want you to turn to your left and turn to your right and look at the person sitting on either side of you. I said, and I want you to imagine a time where somebody says to you, I'd do anything for you. Mm. I said, and that's pretty cool. That's pretty rare. I said, you, you know, in life, you don't find a lot of people that have your, have your six, have your back all the time. Mm -hmm. I said, now look at that same person again and imagine knowing that that person would die for you. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's big, you know, and it's like, um, prayers, prayers out to your, uh, Douglas as well. Um, that's, that's definitely, yeah, I see that. that's definitely hard to, to, to imagine. So we're definitely praying for him, but yeah. you know, like you said, you know, that, that camaraderie that you get from being in the military. And I think that's what allows us, you know, really people of the league or, you know, uh, cigar, uh, shop owners or the manufacturers, like we understand at the end of the day, we got each other's back. It does not matter what we look like. It does not matter what we sound like. It doesn't matter where we come from. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, this the, the bond that you get over cigars is what needs to be cherished. Absolutely. You know, those conversations that you normally wouldn't have with somebody, but because y'all smoking a cigar, y'all sitting next to each other in the cigar lounge, y'all can sit there and know that at the end of the day, we're bonding, you know, on, over, on behalf of you know, the cigar and the love of the leaf, man. And, yeah. and, and, and D, I, I tell you, you know, speaking of the, 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 the love of the leaf, you know, you're, you're like, let me make sure I don't misquote it, but you're like a first sister of the leaf on the, the virtual smoke deck. And, you know, um, I really oh, wanted this, that, that should, that should touch your home. It that does. It does. And, and, and I, and I wanted it so bad because, um, you know, so many women out there, that loves to smoke cigars. And, and it's really not a, a thing where it's, it's muzzled anymore. Obviously, you know, women come out and I smoke cigars. Nobody judges it. But back in the day, like women yeah. love cigars, but it was like, oh, you smoke cigars. They try to, they try to, you know, perceive it as smoking cigarettes. You know, it was like a dude's hobby. And, you know, 2015 has really changed the trajectory on the, the ginger, the ginger, uh, balance in the in the cigar community, and mm -hmm. you know, seeing you doing what you're doing in uh, New Jersey is immaculate. You know, and when I met you in the whereby, I'm like, it was no conversation. It was like, hey, you want to do it? You can do it. <laughs> All right, perfect. Let's do it. I, I hit it, hit you up and set it up because I wanted the dynamic of the conversation to erect on the screen. You know, to yeah. see the different perspectives of the industry and what it done does for you and what it does for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and two different aspects is amazing. Look, I mean, I can remember it was actually a vet friend of mine, Rusty, who told me about cigar, he told me about Cigar Fest in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, yeah. right? Yeah. I didn't know about it. He's he's trying to tell me and do whatever. So this is probably back in 2013, maybe? Mm -hmm. 2012, 2013, right around there. You know, and so he's telling me, and so he says, "Let you know, I'll let's go up for a day. I'll, I'll take you up there." And he knew at the time, like I wasn't, you know. Uh, actually, I don't even. It might have been 2011. Now that I'm thinking about it, it was 2011 because I didn't even have my dog at that point. And um, so we go. I mean, I've never seen so many. <laughs> people in my life so i'm in nightmare stage anyway like oh shit you know so uh and we get there and i look around and i mean 
you couldn't see a woman around. You, there was just nobody. There was nobody. This place is like, you know, you know, it's like 3,000 people in there. And I'm lucky that the women are there giving out the bags as you come through the line. And they're looking at me going, oh, my God, a woman, you know, like I, everybody's like making this big deal out of it. So we get over and there and, and we actually were near the Gurkha booth. Uh huh. And they were doing their signs, you know, they were, they were uh, autographing them and giving them to people. Well, it got like, it got really bad. It was jammed. So my buddy, he kind of gets up, you know, he gets where he's kind of trying to protect me because I'm feeling some sort of way and I can't move. And all of us and people were like, you know, putting their hands up, trying to get these signs. And <laughs> it was like freaking Moses part, part, uh, parting the sea. All of a sudden, I hear I hear the dude up at Gurkha go, "Wait a minute!" And he makes everybody move, and he goes, "I thought I saw a woman." He says, "Come here." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no spotlight. You know, me who doesn't want to be. I'm like, I just want to be under the radar. Yeah. You know? And because of that, like he signed a thing, and he says, "You know, I want to give this to you because you know we don't see any we don't see any women." So fast forward to like 2016, 2017, and the number of women there, now it's not, everybody's not like whipping their head around and going, oh my God, a woman, you know what I mean? There's a lot of women there, and it does my heart good to see where the cigar industry is going, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, you know, oh, look, okay. it's always going to be, in my opinion, a male-dominated industry. Mm -hmm by the nature of the beast, mm -hmm. you know, it will equalize. It's starting to equalize. It still has a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But to me, to look back at that and now see it here, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just, it's crazy. You know what I mean? Like I would have never thought if you'd asked me that back in 2011 or 2012, I'd have been like, man, I don't know if I'll come back there. You know, this is like wild. You know? <laughs> You know, John asked a question: What what got you to fall in love with cigars? And I want to hold that one because we're about to kind of dump uh, jump into that right now. Okay. Um, and you know, one of the things that you mentioned in the beginning of our, our segment was that when you first got into cigars, uh, a friend of yours brought you to a cigar lounge, um, and this was before Royal Leaf in your area. Mm -hmm. um, so, kind of fast forwarding from that position there to where you are now. What made you go ahead and open Royal Leaf up in uh, Millville, New Jersey? All right. So I was going to a shop. I found this this shop. Actually, it's a place I used to buy my tobacco for my pipes. And I knew the guy, and I never paid attention to the cigars. I never paid attention to them. They had tons of cigars in there. I never paid attention because I only went in to get pipe tobacco. And he, he made his own mixes. They were They were phenomenal, right? Yeah. And he would take care of my pipes and do whatever. So, you know, now I'm, you know, flash forward, I'm back and I'm smoking cigars. And uh, I don't, I don't know a lot. I was, I was fortunate. My first cigar was a uh, Arturo Fuente Chateau. Mm. Okay. So you had a good I stick on no. I didn't appreciate it then. I had no <laughs> idea what I was smoking. I know. no idea what I was smoking, you know. So... I started to get, you know, I'm that kind of person. I, I immerse myself because I want to know more. And I'm very, I consider myself a very sensory individual. Like um, I give you, I give you a weird example. Like with PTSD, people get flashbacks. They see images that trigger them, whatever. For me, a lot of it is odors. Uh huh. Uh, it's sensory, you know, or, or so it only stands to reason with tobacco having smoked pipes and stuff that I was very much into the flavors uh -huh. and trying to learn and trying to understand. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would listen to people, I would talk to people and I wasn't around a lot of people. I really wasn't. So I, I met, I met a couple, Mike and Sharon. I met Not them. Mike yeah. Mike and Sharon. Uh, we're still, we're still great friends. Um, I met them at an event at the, at the shop I was going at. And, uh, you know, here I was, first female I'd run into. And she wasn't smoking when I met her. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at her. I'm like a puppy dog. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. 
and I like sit down next to her, you know, and I'm like, hi, you know, and so I, I finally say to her, so like, do you smoke cigars? And she's like, well, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. So it just, it's just evolved organically where I, you know, started getting into more of that. Right and then week. Mike turned me on to Cigar Dojo. Okay, so I signed up in 2013. I've been on Dojo since since 2013. And that was like that was like the magic rabbit hole just like opened up and like kicked you down. There was like no way not to go down a rabbit hole because right. I'm looking at all these pictures and now I'm getting curious. You know, I'm seeing pictures. I'm seeing labels. I don't know. You know, I'm like, where's this cigar from? Where did this come from? How did this, you know, and right. I just started buying more and I just started tasting more and doing more. And then through Cigar Dojo, I went to Nicaragua in 2015. Mm. I went to the Drew Estate Cigar Safari. And so there it kicked, that takes you to a whole different level. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you go see in Nicaragua. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You're still getting that education. You're still understanding why this costs what it costs, what makes it taste the way it tastes, you know, and it becomes, you know, um, I equate this to wine. I equate this to wine tasting and people that collect people that, you know, the nuances. And I never really understood that. I understood it on one level, but what, the more I got into the cigars, the more that I began to understand that and, and really was like, you know, I came back from Nicaragua, man. My head was like ready to explode, but it was you know, like, yeah, I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lot so much so that I wound up going back again, which then the second time I was able to take in more, I was able to, you know, um, I would read, you know, I'm working on, you know, the tobacconist book doing stuff like that. Um, I went back actually with Eric Espinosa and some people from my shop uh, a year ago we went, we went, stayed at AJ Fernandez. So it's like every few years, if I go, it's like, you just, you just learn more. And then, and then there's just the experience of talking to people. So the shop I, I was going to, you know, it was kind of going downhill. The guy was getting older. He retired. He sold it. Uh, people took it over. Interestingly enough, not a person that worked there smoked cigars. So that tells you the story where this shop is headed, right? So I start blogging. I'm doing my blog, Queen of Cigars. And I wind up going to IP, uh, ICP, yeah, IPCPR. Yeah. And this is like 20, I don't know, might be 2016, somewhere in there. And I'm walking through and I'm doing whatever. And I stop at the Epic booth and I'm talking to this guy. And, you know, six degrees of separation, right? Yeah. So I'm talking to him, and he asks me where I'm from. I tell him I live in Vineland, New Jersey. He looks at me, and he goes, I live in Atco, which is, like, literally, <laughs> you know, I right, look right at him. Corner, pretty much. He proceeds to tell me about the Royal Leaf. The Royal Leaf existed. He proceeds to tell me about it. That it's a husband and wife team that have it, and it's in two little. Sh it's in a shed in this little shopping area in Millville. It says you got to go check it out. So I go check it out. Why not, Johnny? We're gonna get back to you in a little bit, brother. Okay, I go check it out. Now I start going there because the other place is just going downhill. Yeah. Then they move from that location to our current location. And now I'm going there more, you know, and I would, I would stand office at first, you know, because, you know, I would take Gunner with me and be with me, my dog and stuff. And, um, I was doing reviews at the time for blind man's puff. So I would take my cigars in there. I'd go at a table and I'd sit there, I'd do them and whatever. And then one thing led to another, this shop is very unique. A lot of women in there, mm. a lot of couples. It's really, really cool. Yeah. So that's what happened. It started to evolve and, you know, I got involved. We would do things, we would do things outside of the cigar realm as group, as a group, you know, we'd go to dinner somewhere, we go, you know, whatever. So it wasn't just there. It was pulling me out and getting me involved. And so what happened is um, I'm there one night and uh, 
Pete and Tiff. Shout out to them. They're the original uh, owners. Yeah, Irizari. And um, I'm walking out the door, and literally my truck is right there at the at the front door. You know, like I don't have far to walk. Yeah. And Tiff says to me, "I don't walk you out." Well, I give her a stupid look, like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Am I that bad? <laughs> This old lady can't make it 10 feet, you know? <laughs> so so we get outside, and it's like this awkward silence. And all of a sudden, she looks at me, and she goes, so. And, you know, from where I come from, my childhood and stuff, you say that to me, I'm waiting for what I did wrong, you know? Right. <laughs> like, right. you know like, so that's when, they, you know, she said that they were going to relocate to Florida because all their family was down there, and they were looking for somebody to buy the shop. Mm. You know, I drove away from there going, did that just happen, man? Did I just hear this right? Right. And it was, it was like from there on, it moved, it moved pretty fast. Mm. This was like the end of August of uh, 2019 mm. and December 6th, we had the closing and transfer. Wow. So yeah. Yeah. And that, and it's been a year. It's been yeah. a year. So, yeah. And it, it, you know, so you got December 6th and then you got COVID. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> now, at, so, so uh, let's get to Johnny's question real quick. And then we're, I'm going to caveat from that, that conversation. His, his question mm -hmm. was, what's your favorite uh, drink to pair with your cigars? You know what, Rima? Rima? Um... I am more of a coffee drinker. In fact, I didn't even, I was having trouble with my headphones, so I didn't even get a chance. My coffee maker is sitting like 15 <laughs> feet from me, and I, I'm like, damn it, I want a cup of coffee. <laughs> is it made already? No, it's not. I just oh, got to go turn the thing on, you know? Go we'll turn uh, it on real quick. Yeah, I might, I might just uh, do that real quick, you know, like, you know. Um, but, yeah, I pair coffee mostly, but... If I'm trying to do a review or something like that, I just drink water. You know, but I am a martini girl, mm -hmm. but I like flavored martinis. I, mm -hmm. I like to pair weird things with cigars sometimes. Like I'll take something that just really doesn't sound like it should go like a real sweet drink with, you know, with uh, usually like a pretty, a pretty full bodied cigar or whatever, and see if it balances itself and, you know, whatever. I like Bloody Marys. Now, you know, I can do Bloody Marys all day. Um, you know, rum. Yeah. Depends. I'm not a huge bourbon drinker or a scotch drinker. I, I drunk, drank scotch when I was young and I just don't, it, it's okay for me, but it's just not where my, where my palate goes. At the, and you know, what's crazy is I was just talking to a good friend of mine the other day and I was like, um, I was like, man, uh, I was drinking my coffee. I drink my Starbucks coffee every morning. Mm -hmm. And I usually smoke a cigar right along with it. Yeah. Um, and I I told him, I said, man, the, honestly, the best way to mix and, well, to really taste the flavors of a cigar is with coffee. Coffee, yeah. water, or wine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was talking to Michael Herlock last, uh, last week, and we got onto this subject heavy. And... You know, I think honestly, those allow you to actually dive deeper into the notes of the cigar versus a bourbon, a scotch, or you know, rum or anything of that nature, or whiskey. Um, I, I feel like it, it throws off your taste buzz a little bit, and you may taste something different in the cigar versus what you actually really taste if you had a more right. calm and refreshed palate. Right, um, exactly. I, I agree with you there. I mean. Uh, Cynthia, I saw her comment, yeah. contrast pairing. So I like contrast pairing. I use coffee. I use alcohol more for contrast pairing. And I use, uh, I use coffee more for, um, to bring out coffee notes and, and things like that. And certain cigars that I know have that, have that in them. So it just depends on what I'm feeling like. I, I every, every morning I have coffee and I, and I actually smoke, I would say 90, percent of the time I smoke a protocol Themis mm -hmm. with that coffee Good. because it just pairs so well. 
media for people that don't know what a protocol thymus is is more of a media a mild to medium body cigar um it comes with it's, it's an echinor uh, excuse me a nicaraguan blend um mm -hmm. uh that has a connecticut wrapper on it and it's a phenomenal smoke i think that's if i'm not mistaken i believe that's one that kevin um blended himself uh i may be mistaken kevin you're on so you can jump on that one um uh, but i mean ultimately <laughs> this dude <laughs> as an inside joke you're right you're right my adult friend <laughs> but anyway you know talking about you know the lounge um yes what what was the hardest part of one consuming that and building it into your brand that it is now uh, based on based on the chemistry that was already there well like everything else People don't like change, even when it's good. Even when it's good. That's why yeah. I tell people that's just human nature. We're, we're creatures of habit, yeah. whether we admit it or not. You know, all of us at some level, we like, we like things the way we like them. So anytime there's going to be a change, you know, uh, people are used to a certain dynamic. It's, it's, you know, it's that anxiety. It was anxiety provoking for everybody. You know, for the longest time when people found out, I didn't feel like I could go. I actually stopped going to the shop for a little while because I would go in and I would feel like people thought I was sitting there looking around, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and they're worried about is this going to change? Is that's going to change? You know, what's going to happen to the price of cigars? What cigars are going to go? You know, and then the rumor mill starts that because that's just people. OK, the rumor mill starts and, and, and it can get ugly. It can get, you know, it can get ugly. So I made a decision to sort of pull back a little bit. It wasn't like I didn't have anything on my plate. I had a ton on my plate and try to get things settled. And um, I, I had a partnership and, you know, like everything else, you know, some some marriages work and some don't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it has it's nobody's fault. It's just dynamics. It's just whatever. So going into it, we struggled. Yeah. My my first partner and I, we, we struggled horribly and uh, we managed. But I felt like we couldn't we just couldn't we couldn't turn a corner that I wanted to turn to to just as you say, to start to brand it like it's my own. Yeah. OK, everything was kind of like still the same. We were changing cigars and adding cigars, but nothing else was changing. And I, I so badly wanted to, to hit that corner because in my mind, I again, I in my gut, I knew where I wanted to go. And I just I just couldn't get there. And COVID COVID complicated things so much. And, you know, uh, it made it so hard for my partner and I because, you know, of his job and stuff. We just, it was just really bad. And so I came to this crossroads and I had to figure out, you know, what am I going to do with this? And, and in the meantime, my partner got another opportunity and it was basically a mutual decision that that was a better opportunity for him. And, you know, but that left me in a position of what am I going to do now? Right. You know what I mean? What do I do? And I'm thinking I'm not even a year into this and have I failed? I mean, I really, I really went in hard on myself hard. and then especially being a female, you talk about that, you know, it's like uh, here, yeah, a female takes over and look what happens to the shop. And you know what I mean? And all I could think of is that I didn't want to let the people down that the, the foundation of this, of this brick and mortar. Yeah. And so I was very, very fortunate. I wound up uh, replacing one partner with three. Mm. And let me tell you, that happened, and that was a whirlwind. That was a whirlwind. That actually happened in September, mm -hmm. and um, September 11th, actually, oh, wow. crazy. <laughs> and um, from that point on, it was like, I don't know, man. It was like everything, all, all the stuff that was just dragging and couldn't do and couldn't do and couldn't do. All of a sudden, it just got accelerated, and I wound up. We remodeled the place made it the color and the vision of what I was looking for. You know, the shop looks completely different. It has a completely different feel to it now, but it has the feel that I envisioned that warm, that hominess when you walk in of just, you know, you can come in and take that deep breath. Yeah. 
and just and just relax. And you know, we're st that's still in progress. We're still doing stuff. And you know, it's a you know, like I said, we got to December, and I said, man, we had our we had our grand reopening the beginning of December, mm -hmm. well attended, protocol supported us. The place was packed. Yeah, we had a protocol. yeah, we, protocol. I'll tell you what, they've been they've been phenomenal with us. Uh, we're a Lazona. Espinosa shop, just so you know that. And speaking of that, I just want to show you something. So this is what I'm smoking. Okay, the blue label. But I want to show you this. Oh wow, that was a good aged cigar. <laughs> yeah. you know, a lot of people be like, take uh, the cellophane off, take the cellophane off, put it in your humidor. And I'm like, no, 